A big welcome to you all. Thank you very much for coming to this virtual talk that I'm giving this afternoon on designing events for the ears. Now, just to start off um, with a little bit of housekeeping, please make sure that you have your volume on so that you can hear what I'm saying. There will be sound effects coming through your computer throughout this talk. And also to bear in mind that this presentation is mainly geared for when the world gets back to normal, for when we're back out in the real world and experiencing life in its fullest. I'm gonna start off with a story today. This one is from North Hargreaves and McKendrick. And I want you to ask, what can this do for my brand? There's a case study where they set up in a supermarket two identical displays full of French wine and German wine. And what they did is on alternative days, they played French and German music. So one day you heard this. And the next day, you heard this. Some German music. What happened when the French music was playing was French wine outside of German wine by five bottles to one. However, when German music was playing, the German wine outside the French wine by two bottles to one. How does this happen? Why does this happen? And why can you and how can you use this in your events is what we're going to be discussing over the next 30 minutes. Because sound does an amazing thing. Sound affects you. And we as human beings have four main ways of communicating, writing, reading, speaking and listening. On the slide that I've presented here, they're shown as equals. However, in society, we don't think they're treated as equals. We think it's something more like this. If a child leaves school unable to read or write, then something's gone very, very badly wrong with the system. But how many people do you know are completely incapable of listening? I have to admit, this is something that several ex-girlfriends have accused me of on several occasions. A complete inability to listen, to take in information. And the sound around us, the sound that your delegates experience when they go to your events affects people. It affects them in three very powerful ways. It affects their happiness, it affects their effectiveness, and it affects their well-being. And we've developed a very weird relationship with sound. When we go to a restaurant designed to see it in the glass, the sound all around you, you're unable to have a conversation with a person sitting in front of you. You board an airplane. Your seatbelt must be fast. Whenever the seatbelt lights are illuminated, please not have a fast seatbelt. Please adjust for the authorities. It's a very perverse relationship with sound we've developed, and it drives us all absolutely mad. And it means in the normal world, where there's a dental and unpleasant nature to say, you stand on the street corner shouting at the person. If you have a hearing, you will shut the sound off. So, with eyelids, you can close off visual information, but you can't close off audio information, which has led to us having a relationship with sound, which is very unconscious. We bury our heads in the sound. And this is very, very dangerous because sound is affecting everyone who goes to your events in four extremely powerful ways. The first of which is physiological. Sound affects your body, it affects how your body works, it affects your breathing, it affects your heart rate. It affects all your bodily, um, yeah, your entire body. And we've learned that through our primary warning system that a sudden noise equals danger. Through me just playing that sound to you right there, I gave you all a shot of cortisol, your fight or flight hormone. If you were to be walking through the woods late at night and you were to hear a twig snap behind you, that warning system would kick in. Similarly, I could play something like this, which is surf going at a very relaxing 12 cycles per minute, which is roughly the same breathing rate of a sleeping human being. This is having a physiological impact on you all right now. It's affecting your emotions, it's affecting your bodily functions. The second way sound affects you is psychological. Sound affects your moods, it affects how you feel. Coupled with an image like this, playing a sad piece of music can have a very powerful effect on people. Another piece of music, well, another sound that can affect people psychologically very well is both the human voice and nature sound. Hopefully you're hearing some birdsong right now. Birdsong is a very powerful tool, 
as we've learned over the years, it's when the birds stop singing, it's time to be what well, things are going wrong. And what birdsong does is it puts you in a very body relaxed, mind alert state, which is great for thinking. The third way sound effects is, is cognitive. If you're listening very to this version to of me, two you're on the wrong track. The time. Try listening to the other one. It's not impossible to understand two people talking at the same time. The human brain can take in, on average, 1.6 to 1.8 human conversations. Any more than that, you're going to start getting distracted. Which, if you sit in an office like this, <laughs> open plan offices can decrease productivity by up to 66%. That was a study made by Banbury and Berry in 1998. The final way that sound affects you is behaviourally. Have a listen to this piece of music and imagine it's someone driving in a car. Chances are the person driving to this piece of music aren't going to be driving at a steady 28 miles an hour. That's because sound affects how we behave. It affects our bodily rhythms. If I was to play this, Chances are you're all going to want to get out of this room very quickly. And that's because sound massively affects our emotions. For example, this musical person sitting here is So, those are the four ways that sound has the ability to affect you. And you've got to be thinking throughout this entire talk what is going on at my conferences? What is going on at my events? Anytime anyone goes to them, they are going to be affected physiologically, psychologically, cognitively, and behaviorally by all the sound that is constantly surrounding them. It's really important to know whilst I'm talking about this that the senses don't work by themselves. There's a very good study done by Zampini and Spence on crisps. And that was that they boosted the, um, they put people with um, headphones on and boosted the frequency of the headphones at five kilohertz which is the, um, the sort of um, frequency range where crisps get more crunchy. And what people reported back is they could taste a 15% difference in their mouth of it being more crunchy. Similar case study of how sound can affect a product or a brand is from Axe or Lynx, where there was a study done by Zampini and Spence, where well, what happened was is thanks to CFCs being banned, um, Lynx and Axe cans stopped making the normal ch sound and started making a more pathetic f sound. And through that, they were inundated with complaints from people saying that the Lynx effect was no longer working. Men were no longer being chased down the beach by hordes of women. Something was going very, very badly wrong with, the, with their product. What was it? And it was a product sound. It had a weaker sound. And people associated it with the smell. Once they fixed the, CFC, fixed the CFCs, the complaints stopped. Final little thing on how sound affects people. Restaurants that are overly loud affect people's ability to taste salt and sweet. So if you have an extremely loud event or congress where people are being affected cognitively, chances are they're not going to be able to take in as much information as you'd want them to at that event. This is all really important because sound is the gateway to emotion. I mean, the gateway to the emotions are the senses. But what sound and smell are compared to sight and touch is they're non-conscious. And this is important to know because the decision process in brand adoption, engagement and loyalty is actually 70% emotional. People buy based off emotions. If I was to show you this slide here of these four different car types based on price, engine, power, torque, it's very hard to decide which car you'd want to potentially buy. However, if I was to reveal the brands of these cars, chances are you would know immediately which car was the one for you. Again, this is us working in this a big emotional non-conscious space with brand adoption. Think back to the last time you made a really, really big purchase. Did you have a need for it as you were on the way to the shops? Or was there a need that kicked in when you were in the shops and you rationalized the purchase afterwards? 
if it was something really big, chances are it was that case of, I want it, I need it now. And then afterwards you thought it through. It's like, yes, well, this was a perfectly valid decision. People buy, people engage with brands based on emotions. And a big issue with events and brands is that the eyes tend to have it. In fact, there's a study done on this of Fortune 500 companies that showed that 83% of their marketing budget was spent on what things look like, not how they sounded. And we think there's a massive mismatch going on here. What I have here for you on this slide is the weighting of importance that people give to the senses versus the Fortune 500 spend. And we at the sound agency tend to think there's a bit of a gap here that can be exploited to make brands a lot better, to make events way more engaging, to really capitalize on how people experience the world and how they like to experience the world. Because this is what this is all about for me. This is about experience, designing events so that they're an amazing experience, both visually and orally. And it's good to think, if you have a promise of a brand, you're promising something. Is it aligned with the experience? Is what you're telling people they will be attending aligned with what you're giving them in every single sense? It's not about appearances. It's about experiences. Now, the thing to know about this is that your brand is making sound right now. <laughs> Successful brands design with their ears. I'm now going to take you through a whole pile of case studies of different brands of what they've done using different audio assets. And every single one of these, I want you to think, what could my experience be doing? What could my event be doing with these different types of sonic assets? How could they be making my event better? The first is a sonic logo. Everyone knows what a sonic logo is when I play one. If I was to play this. People tend to know the Intel sonic logo way better than they do what it actually visually looks like. Another great example of a sonic logo is this one, SNCF. Anyone who's ever taken a train around France will know this sound. After every single announcement. But it's a brilliant way to engage with people with your brand. They may not be looking around, but they'll hear this audio cue and they'll know where they are. Good case to be Dave Gilmore recently sampled this into these albums. Another way that you can engage with people is your brand's music, your event's music. This is a really good case study of what British Airways did a while back and why it was wrong. This is the flower you went. Everyone knows it. It's the British Airways music. Anyone who has flown with British Airways knows what it is. It's on their advertisements. It's on their flights. It's part of the brand. And what they did several years ago, which was a huge mistake, is they replaced it with this. We believe your holiday should start before you arrive. This is John Depp. You're our guest. You should expect to check in online. Choose where to sit. Well, Fly to destination. Don't know when I'll be back again, which is quite relevant for now, is also a terrible line for an airplane to be, man to be putting out there. And secondly, it was just completely incongruent with the brand. The, the flower duet had become something that people recognized. It became something that people were emotionally attached to. And by getting rid of it for a couple of months, they really, really tarnished their brand. They were flooded with complaints. They changed it back and all was now well. Well, as well as it can be. Brand voice. How does your brand communicate verbally with people? If your brand or your event was a human being, who would they be? What gender would they be? How old would they be? How would they speak? Then if there are announcements happening at your event, are they completely aligned with your brand voice? All these different ways of communicating. Here comes, this one's a fun one. I'm gonna play you a bit of music now and see if you recognize it. actually the original Nokia ringtone. It's a piece of classical music. 
what they did is that when they were launching the first Nokia device, they had a whole pile of different pieces of music that they thought might be the default ringtone. And they chose that one because it's the only one out of copyright, so it was free. It became this. Which at the time of around 2004, there was a study done which showed it was the most played piece of music in the world, being played 1.8 billion times per day, overtaking Happy Birthday. Skype, pretty famous for their earcon. Apple as well are pretty famous for their sounds. I'm going to talk to you very quickly, having discussed earcons and what they could be doing on your app to engage people with the brand about music and where the power of music comes from. Music is all about recognition and association. That's how it becomes so powerful. If you have an audio identity and people start associating it with your brand, that's a really, really powerful tool. And as I just showed with the British Airways example, once it's become lodged into people's brains, it becomes a huge selling part of the brand. A couple of examples of things that are ex exceedingly recognizable. That's the first chord of a hard day's night. Everyone tends to get that. This is very famous as well. Jaws. You know it from two notes. Don't go in the water. That's what music can do. That's what sound can do in terms of branding. People recognize it, associate it, power. Podcasts are a fantastic way for anyone to reach out as well, especially if you're building an event or a brand. It's one of the easiest ways to reach out to an audience. And it's one of the most biggest growing businesses in the world right now. Advertising revenue, as you can see from this graph, is projected to go over a billion dollars for the first time this year from podcasts. Now, with all these audio tools that I'm talking about, those five being the main five, really, apart from soundscapes, which we'll get onto, it's really important to know that what you can't do is just start putting a load of sound into a noisy environment. One brand that knows this really well is Starbucks. You have a lot of noise going on. And if you just start playing music with audio branded content on top of that, all you're doing is putting icing on mud. It's not a cake. It's going to sound fairly atrocious and people are going to want to leave fairly quickly. That's why what we tend to tell people about when it comes to designing events is what I've presented here, the four different ways a space can have sound in it. The first is acoustics, then there's the noise, which is how sound behaves inside a space. Noise sources, what sounds are playing. Sound system, the quality of the system that's playing the audio. Then finally, the content itself that's being played into it. These are the four different components that you need to build up from the bottom to have a beautiful sounding event. With acoustics, I'm gonna give you a couple of little numbers now that can really help for designing things. When sound hits the surface, it can do three things. It can either be reflected, it can be absorbed, or it can be transmitted. Two types of numbers for you all to bear in mind when designing a space. One is the noise reduction coefficient, if it has an NRC of 0.9, that means 10% of sound is being reflected back. STC, that's the sound transmission coefficient, and that's a logarithmic scale. But basically, if you've got an STC of 30, it means about one eighth of sound is being transmitted across. That's acoustics. If you have a very, very loud space, if you have a room that is thunderous, that is horrendous to go into, then have a think, what could we be doing acoustically to treat a room so that people have a nicer experience when they go in and have more cognitive space? They associate your event and the sound of your event with something really positive. Noisy spaces, they're terrible for collaboration, concentration, contemplation, and communication, which may be what you want at your event. If you have some people being constantly bombarded by noise, they're not going to be able to concentrate on the speeches that are not taking place. They're not going to be collaborating together at the event as you want. It's going to lead to a worse event. Something that's really big right now as well when it comes to designing for events is bio video. Something for you to think about, something that can really help. And that's all about bringing the outside world in. How can you bring nature into spaces to engage people 
This all builds up to this slide, which is doorways, and what it's like to go into your event. Doorways are amazing things. How many times do you know you go from one room to the other and you can't remember what you're going into that next room for? That's because human beings are designed to process what's directly in front of them. Again, it's a very early warning system. We're really good at looking around, observing, and taking in loads of information. And if you go into a space that's extremely loud, extremely noisy, it's going to put a lot of pressure on people. It's going to affect them physiologically. Their heart rate's going to increase, their breathing's going to increase, their hormone secretion's going to increase. And they're going to be put into fight or flight mode, which isn't optimal for your events. It's going to affect them psychologically. It'll affect their mood. It'll affect them cognitively. They won't be able to take in as much information and it will affect their behavior. Being able to design your event, being able to go into your event with your eyes shut and knowing you've created a beautiful environment for these events to take place. I hope I'm getting through to you right now that it's a really powerful tool for people engaging with your brand and for people to have a pleasant experience whilst they're in their space. For the last sort of five minutes, I'm just going to talk you through a case study we did for the European Society of Cardiology and how we built up their audio brand, what we did with them, and how we then created this audio brand that they've now deployed throughout all their events. What we do as an agency is we'll start off looking at brand values, and this is how you build any brand up. We define what these brand values are. You define what the space looks like. What is the space it's going to be? You do an audit. You then look at what you want people to be experiencing physiologically, psychologically, behaviorally, and cognitively. What do you want to elicit from people as they go to your event? Do you want them to be energized? Do you want them to be you know, having a fun time? Do you want them to be you know, focused? How fast do you want them to be walking around your trade show floor? All of these different things you can do with sound and if you design it. Once you know what the sound or what you're trying to elicit in terms of behavior, in terms of physiological reactions, then you can start looking at the content that you're going to deploy. You can design a sonic logo for your brand. That's the one we did for ESC. It's got a heartbeat built into it since they're all about cardiology. You can start looking at soundscapes to play in the background to affect people's behavior. This example here is if you want people to relax, you want people to feel calm, reassured. We work, you also do different soundscapes for different um, emotions. So you want people to connect better, have a connecting zone where people can, can connect. Nature soundscapes is another thing we did. Then, if you think people are going to be going up onto stage and back, some branded call to action music that's on point. Letting them know that a speech is about to take place. Then something else that we did was also walk on music. So as people were walking up onto the stage, once you've done that and you've designed what audio content you want, it's time to deploy it. Looking at it from a zonal point of view, looking at what time do you want this content to play? What content do you want to create? Where is it going to go? What system is required? What sound system do you need for your event? What accents are needed? to make this actually happen. Good rules for you all to bear in mind about content deployment is it's branded, well zoned, and time-based. If you get that right, you're pretty much off to a winner. Then work with the sound system PABA team to make sure it gets implemented properly. The final thing you can do with your event, which is really important with sound, is to listen. Really listen to what's going on. Looking at the four ways I talked about sound in a space earlier, what are the acoustics like? What is the effect people are going to be have whilst they're in this space? What noise sources are there? How can we move those noise sources so that they're not interrupting people during this convent? What's the sound system like? What content are you deploying? With that, site visits, just walk around, look at the zones, 
look at what's being played, look at what's there and just understand what it's going to be doing to people who go to that event. The final thing I'll leave you to remember is that good sound is good business. If you optimize all the things I've talked to you about today, if you think about how sound affects people physiologically, psychologically, cognitively, and behaviorally, start thinking about how it's going to be affecting people at events and start looking at building an emotional, engaging relationship with your customers who go to your events, then I'm sure you'll be able to put sound to good use. Thank you very much. Johnny, thank you very much. I cannot believe how quickly that session went. And I hope everyone was listening in. And we've got some questions coming in for you, Johnny. We've got some time for Q&A. We do. Um, I am encouraging everybody. I can almost see a nice few faces. Please make sure you've downloaded the Crowd Compass app. I have reminded you enough times in the chat box. But if you haven't or you're having some problems downloading that or using that and you have some questions for Johnny, then for once, let's use the chat box on Zoom and we'll try and manage that as well. It's a good job for a new moderator who's doing this online. Johnny, thanks so much, so much. I was scribbling away myself. But um, a question that's come through on the app for you. Mm. Do or should AV companies take this all on board in terms of sound? And is it something they can become consultants or advisories on? Good question, whoever that was. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it really depends on what you want your business to be, right? If you want to have that as a service, fine. If you want to outsource it to companies who do offer this sort of thing, like mine, then you can reach out to us as well. Um the whole point of this talk was just to get people to be aware of listening, be aware of what's going on in their events. If you want to take this on as something that you want to do, absolutely get, get stuck in. It's, it, providing good sound is what a AV company is there to do, right? So understanding the things I've been talking about and implementing them, it seems like- I guess that question, point. yeah, that question is sort of saying, you know, make sure that they're part of that, like your business, you're part of this whole planning process. Yeah, sound exactly. Sound is so important. So, yeah setting up that you know that spreadsheet i showed towards the end of the big plan just understanding all of these different elements come together to create the experience and it's just about getting them all as aligned as possible somebody's asked johnny's company is the sound agency hope uh That's that correct. answers that for you victor we've got a question here johnny for you on chat what would you implement in a networking space in terms of sound and have you got some examples of that Good question. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, with networking, what you want to do in a space where people are going to be talking the entire time is to think, right, the action here is to get a space where it's easy for people to understand what's going on. So you want to be able to have massive amounts of cognitive ability with people who are there. So what's the best way to get people's minds to be as free as possible to focus on the person opposite them talking? So in that sort of space, you want to have as much sound absorption as possible going on really in the walls so that if people are talking constantly around each other, it's not going to become overwhelming and overly loud in that space. In terms of background content, I'd really look at biophilia. So we're launching a new product called Mood Sonic, um, which is all about sound in offices, basically. So sound to help people focus and collaborate and talk. So using nature sound, as I said at the start, so bird song or water song, is really good for freeing up people's um, space to think. And avoiding, the best one really, if you do have any music playing, just avoid lyrics. Because when people start hearing lyrics, that's when that becomes an extra voice inside people's head. And then it becomes really, really hard to sort of talk and think. Start singing and going off in a complete another direction, which is not what you want when you want no. to be focused on something. Some questions, they're all coming in now, which is great. Thank you. Keep them coming. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, does sound also work in virtual sessions, Johnny? Um, you guys will have to tell me. You're the one who experienced this one. <laughs> um, it, 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 it depends what you're trying to do, I guess. Um, yes. I mean, in terms of having branded content before people turn up, I think that's a great idea. Um, Making sure, I mean, right now, things to think about with sound is microphone. Do you have a high quality microphone that you're broadcasting over? I'm using this thing, if anyone wants to know. It's a Zoom microphone. 
which is really nice plugged in, making sure that, you know, that's the sound system. What sound system are we using? Telling people before maybe having the best sound system to listen to these things to will make a difference. So yeah, just think through the four ways that sound can, you know, articulate itself in a space, then apply it to a digital event. And yes, I, I think there are definitely ways. Just thinking about the sound system and where can you deploy content to start building up a brand. Well, speaking about brands, um, I had a question in a large and loud trade show environment where we kind of all would like to be right now, I'm sure. Yeah. Is it harder to make an impact with sound? Um, well, the answer to that is the sound will be making an impact, right? The loudness of that is affecting people. So that's what you're doing and you go to that space. If you have massive amounts of sound being bombarded at people, that is the effect that sound's going to be having. Question is, what do you want and how can you sort of balance those two things out? How can you suppress some of the loud noise? How can you employ the better acoustic elements of branding? So just um, any visual signs you have anywhere, printing them on acoustic materials to help absorb some of that trade show noise can really help then your brand cut through. And it's also a sign of your brand showing that it cares, that sort of thing. By actually looking at these things that do affect people, that again is your brand affecting people through sound. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a question, and this is great because we talk, you know, often in our world we think about, you know, inside, inside a trade show or inside a conference room. But how would you manage sound in an outdoor event? Great question. I mean, there, the great thing is that acoustics don't really matter, right? The sound goes off into the sky and you're fine. There, it would be looking at what sound system you have available and then looking at what you want to achieve again in that space, in that outdoor space. We've had some really lovely um, examples of outdoor space. One case study we did um, just to show how powerful sound can be outside. It's a case study we did um, in California. And what we did down the street is we installed 50 different speak uh, loudspeakers down the street and just deployed some very gentle nature sound along with some subtle synthesizers. And we reduced crime in that area by about 15% just through the powerful effect of that sound being played in that area. So indoors or outdoors, it really doesn't matter. It will have a massive effect on how people behave. And it's just looking again at what do you want people to do? How can you use it? I don't know if any of you guys have read the book pre -Srasian. It's a very good book. I highly recommend it. But it's loads of subtle little cues that just affect how people do operate then think, what do I want to happen in this space? And what can I do to plan to make that happen and use sound as a tool? The book was Pre-Suasion by Cialdini. You, how do we, have you got that guys? Yeah, we've got the title, somebody said thanks. We can always just put that into the chat box as well. Johnny or I will I'm, do I'm that. Typing it, I'm typing it now. You're typing it as we speak, see, yeah. instant. We do have some more questions around this whole online world. Do we think a virtual platform will be able to take the delegate through their own resonance agenda? And with that, would it be possible to include sound as you would hear it live at a conference? Very good question. Very good question. I mean, no, it's, everything's limited right now with this digital space, right? And it depends how you set up your event. I mean, I know some people are going to these all-in-one conference solution companies where you log in and you have the entire thing there. IMEX are doing everything by Zoom. And what, what you have to do basically is just look at the software available and what you're using and seeing what you can do. Look where the marginal gains are. Look at how we could do stuff. It's not the same, but find out where the gaps are and see what experience you can create. They're coming through thick and fast. Really, really nice questions. Thank you everyone for these, because I'm sure we're all learning. This is all a new world as much as it's been here for some time, but for us to try and create this engagement and sound is so important. Johnny, can you share a good example of a connect soundscape? Sure. Um, if everyone, um, I could send you one after this if you want. Um, but yeah, that was, um, just looking, connecting, thinking about what people associate it with. So for that, we had some sort of digital sounds in there, uh, mixed in with some synthesizers, very sort of pulsating sort of sound to sort of get people's heart rate up a little bit. Again, no words, 
purely sound and music based and synthesizer based, but that sort of thing people associate with being connected. And that tends to do the trick in terms of getting people to talk to each other and start networking more. Well, we just had following on from that. Did you see Rachel in chat says, what about binaural beats or Great. earth's frequency? Great. Love it all. Yeah. That sort of stuff. Um, I'm a big fan of all these different types of websites. They're all great. Um, the question is, what do you, exactly what brand do you want to sort of put out there? And what you can do, sure, use this sort of stuff, binaural beats. Um, if you've got a bit more of a budget and you want to have something bespoke made, that's even better. It's sort of different tiers of what you're trying to communicate. If you're trying to get exactly across your brand very subtly, then you want something custom made. If you don't have the budget for that, then that sort of stuff is brilliant. It's one of those things that you're keeping on going back and making sure that sound is as important as, as thinking about food and ber- beverage at an yeah, event. It's, it's just part of the event. And like I said, it's one of those things where people don't realize how important sound is really because you feel what you hear and you rationalize what you see. And when you're sitting planning something, it tends to be a very rational thing. You know, you rationalize a spreadsheet. You don't feel a spreadsheet. But when you hear a piece of music, you don't tend to think, oh, I really loved that cadence when they went from a five chord to a one chord and the, you know, that melody played there. That's not how you operate. It's a feeling thing. So sometimes when you're sort of in a more thinking point of view as you're putting these things together, you don't really think about the feeling, emotional side of things. So just understanding that can make a huge difference. How do you want people to feel? And deploying sound at that time, it's a brilliant way to do it. Which is part of our designing of any event experience. How do we want people to think, feel, behave? And how Mm. can we use sound to change that behavior? Um, A couple more questions before we close off. I am conscious that we are running, we are running to time, which is great. Um, Examples have been very anchored in physical events. Yeah. Probably quite obviously. Examples of taking it to the virtual space, which is what we really all need right now um it's sort of sort of a statement the question can we overdo that in a virtual space and how do we balance that with the content so i mean i think the first way that you can do it in a digital space is in your advertising and your marketing right how you get information out about your brand and your event that's going to happen pretty much exactly the same way that it's been happening before you're going to be creating video content you're going to be sharing it then before events start before speeches start Um, having that branded content again playing sort of links the entire thing up. So that's when you start joining up your brand to make it more consistent. That's a really good way of doing it. And when we talk about, when we work with brands a lot in terms of creating these events, just thinking about consistency of touch points is a really good place to start. So looking through your entire customer journey, which will be different for everyone's events, but looking through the customer journey, when do they interact with us? How can we get sound deployed here? How can it be consistent every time they do interact with us? And it's exactly, it's the same process and thought process you would do with a space event as a digital event. And I can't say to anyone how you need to do it with your digital events, because I don't know how your digital events work. But what you have to sort of do is a mini audit of how your digital event's gonna work and looking what the right sound is. But I'm sort of trying to teach you the, the framework to use right now, which is customer journey, When are they going to be interacting with us as a brand? What can we deploy here? How can we use what I've talked about during this talk to make our event sound better and use sound at that time? So they ultimately, you're the perfect speaker. I was just about to say to you, what are, if we don't remember anything, we're overloaded with, with content quite often in this online world. So are they those three things you'd want us to take away from this session and do or what three things would you like us to take away from this session and do differently when it comes down to sound and thinking about this both online and for on-site events um first thing i always like to tell people is just to listen more someone's just put something really good in the chat about you know all this inside quieter time is going to make people think more about what they're getting in through their ears anyway I've, i've noticed it massively sitting in my garden in london i'm on the flight path for heathrow And um, I can hear the birds most of the time, which is lovely as I'm sitting out there having a cup of tea. So just in your day-to-day life, just start thinking about how sound's affecting you because it is constantly. Listen to the outside world. Make that part of what you register and know that's happening to your body. And then just start thinking, what can I be doing at my work, at my events? 
how can I be using this really powerful tool that not that many people realize is available to them? And how can I sort of exploit it and make it work for my business? So listen, um, understand that sound affects people and do some sound because it's fun. I just, this is not a straw poll. Well, this is a straw poll. I'd like people to put their hands up. Interesting that that point from Rachel on the chat around this quieter time. You know, just a real quick show of hands, those on video. You don't have to be on video if you don't wish to. But how many people are actually, like Johnny is, really noticing different sounds since the world has become sort of quieter? Yeah, get some thumbs up here. It's, it really has changed how we're all thinking about it, hasn't it? And it that's, has. Yeah, so people, we're getting the majority of us all saying me and, and that, that's making us so much more attuned. Yeah, all of us are, are feeling that way. It, it's having the space for it. You finally got, it's like I saw this beautiful news article recently, not about sound, but about how um, egg consumption has gone up massively in the UK as people are now spending 10 to 15 minutes on making a breakfast as opposed to wolfing down some porridge. And we've got this sort of, I mean, it's a horrendous thing that's going on, but it's a chance to sort of check in with our bodies, with how we live, understand how they work and improve it. Uh, I'm going to give you guys one last couple, well, one minute, if you have any other questions or you'd like to make a wee little statement before we finish the session. A good point here. We think nature's become more alive. Maybe we've just become more aware. I think we'd all agree here, big thumbs up, that we we have become more aware because that sound is there. Somebody else is noting, I'm sure you're reading these too, but living in the house for 20 years, first time I noted what the what time the birds talk to each other. <laughs> I know their timings now and I feel like I communicate with them. They start very early where I live. I don't know about anyone else. I'm noticing them about 20 past four in the flipping morning. Yeah, especially but, on bank holiday weekend mornings when they, they decide to be a bit louder. Especially on bank holiday weekends, yeah. <laughs> Johnny, I think from everybody here, we'll give you a big uh, thumbs up, a big thank you, a big virtual round of applause, which is this is how is we it do jazz it. Hands? It's jazz hands or a big thank you because we don't want to be too noisy. That was a super session. Everybody can connect in with Johnny on the app. You're linked into his profile. It's Johnny Round from the Sound Agency. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, head back to the lobby. And I look forward to seeing you in the Blue Room for another session this afternoon. Take care, everyone. And thanks, thanks again, guys. Johnny. Cheers. Thanks bye so bye. much.